Our world exists at the mercy of states. It is carved up by their borders, scarred by their conflicts, gutted by their extraction, and diseased by their waste. The people of our world are divided between rulers and ruled, and distracted by further divisions of their state's dictates. This was not always so, and it doesn't have to continue to be so. While states have existed in various forms for the past 5,000 years, they only rose and took their modern form to dominate nearly every square kilometer of this earth in the last 500 years. All I could say is, look how they massacred my planet. Our planet. When people recognize the failures of the status quo, some blame boomers or some shadowy cabal, but at least the radically inclined usually attribute the blame for the state of affairs squarely on the shoulders of the capitalists and by extension the capitalist state. Anarchists, on the other hand, see that the source of our people and planet's exploitation goes much deeper than the economic system. We instead find the source of our exploitation and thus the target of our opposition in the principle of hierarchical power, which manifests in capitalism, yes, but also in every permutation of statecraft, former systems like feudalism and chattel slavery, and enduring institutions and ideologies like patriarchy, colonialism, and more. I will go deeper into what hierarchical power means later on, but for now, I must express that I believe it bears responsibility for every abuse, every tyranny, and every deprivation of people's powers, drives, and consciousness. The anarchist Peter Galilus observed that anarchists have been accused for over a hundred years of both romanticism and radical cynicism. The former for insisting that humanity's base condition is total freedom, and that even now we can create societies free of hierarchical institutions and live on the basis of mutual aid, solidarity, and voluntary association. And the latter for maintaining that all forms of government, from the most dictatorial to the most democratic, are fundamentally oppressive, and that capitalism can produce no more than misery. Whether I look locally at our corrupt, condescending, and cruelly purposeless party politics, or regionally at the various punitive, profiteering, and pitiful post-colonial regimes that populate the Americas, or even internationally at the hegemons past, present, and rising. I see failure. I see disaster. I see subjugation. I don't see our salvation coming from mere shifts with or seizures of state power. I've taken some time to see like a state, and all I could see was that its vision of the world is much narrower than our latent potential as a people. Through its lens and its structures, I saw no solution to our problems, only the source of them. The anarchist Alexander Berkman once said that one will become fully human when they will scorn to rule and refuse to be ruled. But to understand where I and other anarchists are coming from, we'll need to settle on a definition of the state, understand the anarchist critique of it and all other forms of hierarchy, and understand all the ways the state fails both society and nature so that we can let go of statist inevitability and realize the freedom and power of all the people. First, we must define the state itself. As with many of our most politically charged and sociologically potent words, the definition of the state has no academic consensus. Its meaning changes from theory to theory, so in discussions of the state, it's important to clarify which definition you're working with. According to Wikipedia, the state is a political entity, or polity, that regulates society and the population within a territory. Some choose to draw a distinction between the state and government, where the state is the social construct, while the government is the specific administrative bureaucracy that controls the political decision-making monopoly of the state. I don't really care to make that distinction, because I don't find it that useful. I'm opposed to both either way. The Wikipedia definition seems heavily inspired by German sociologist Max Weber, who described the state as a political institution that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. This is the most commonly used definition, and it's one you've probably heard before. One less common yet still valuable definition comes from the founding father of 21st century sociology, Charles Tilley, who described states in his book Coercion, Capital, and European States as coercion-wielding organizations that are distinct from households and kinship groups and exercise clear priority in some respects over all other organizations within substantial territories. Furthermore, 
He identifies the state's seven essential minimal activities as 1. State making, which involves eliminating or neutralizing their rivals and challengers inside their own territory. 2. War making, which involves eliminating or neutralizing their rivals outside of their claimed territory. And 3. Protection, which involves eliminating or neutralizing the enemies of their allies, either inside or outside their claimed territory. In Tilly's other work, he's discussed protection in the context of statecraft differently, essentially calling the state's existence an extortion racket that sells protection from itself, similar to the mafia and other forms of organized crime. Of course, states cannot sustain themselves on just these three activities. The following four are just as essential especially as states grow in scale. 4. Extraction, which involves acquiring the means to carry out the first three activities, which can include taxation, conscription, policing, and other means, because the state cannot uphold itself otherwise. 5. Adjudication, which is when the state steps in as the authoritative settler of disputes among members of the population. 6. Distribution, which involves direct or indirect intervention in the allocation of goods among members of the population. And finally, production, which refers to the state's control over the creation and transformation of goods and services produced by the population. I find Tilly's essential mineral activities useful in analyzing the state's role in human society. So later on, we'll be reviewing how each of these harms us. Another understanding of the state comes from Marxists who do all fully agree with their conception of the state, but do typically regard it as the mere instrument of class rule, where under capitalism, the capitalist class expresses its interest politically through the state. Thus, nearly every variety of Marxism pursues an inversion of this dictatorship of the bourgeoisie through a dictatorship of the proletariat. Also called the Republic of Labour or the Worker State, this dictatorship claims to deprive the capitalist class of political power and represent proletarian interests to resolve the class struggle inherent in the capitalist mode of production and socialize the means of production. I am not a Marxist, but I recognize that in discussions between Marxists and anarchists, the term state is being used in different ways. Marxists see the state as an instrument of political power that can be wielded by anybody, while anarchists see it as a hierarchical institution that is antithetical to our ends and thus not among our tool set of means. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. I first need to introduce an anarchist definition of the state. The anarchist Erico Malatesta wrote that anarchists, including himself, have used the word state and still do to mean the sum total of the political, legislative, judiciary, military, and financial institutions through which the management of their own affairs, the control over their personal behavior, the responsibility for their personal safety, are taken away from the people and entrusted to others who, by usurpation or delegation, are vested with the power to make the laws for everything and everybody and to oblige the people to observe them, if need be, by the use of collective force. Or, as more briefly summarized by Peter Galilus in Worship in Power, the state is a bureaucratic, territorial, coercive organization with multiple levels of administration, in which power is institutional rather than personal, and power holders monopolize, at least ideally, the legitimate use of force and the codification of morality. These are the definitions I'll be using going forward for our modern context, and they seem to track with our current understandings of the various origins of the state not as arising through social contract and the consent of the governed, as some liberals believe, but as arising through its predation on the people. If you really want an in-depth exploration of state formation, you should read Against the Grain by James E. Scott and Worship in Power by Peter Gellus. But I'll keep this brief and summarize just the core ideas they present in their work. For most of human history, people have lived in so-called stateless societies, characterized by a lack of concentrated authority and the absence of large inequalities in economic and political power. In fact, only relatively recently have states almost completely displaced alternative forms of political organization among societies across the planet. Two points to note though. For one, the predominance of stateless societies does not imply the predominance of egalitarian or even anarchic societies. There's a lot we just don't know about our prehistory, but we do know that not every stateless society is inherently anarchist because there's more to anarchism than the absence of a state. Many of them had hierarchies. 
For two, British anthropologist Tim Ingle and I agree when he says that, quote, it is not enough to observe, in an now rather dated anthropological idiom, that hunter-gatherers live in stateless societies, as though their social lives were somehow lacking or unfinished, waiting to be completed by the evolutionary development of a state apparatus. Rather, the principle of their sociality, as Pierre Clastris has put it, is fundamentally against the state. The first states were created in Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, China, Mesoamerica, and the Andes. As Galileus observes in Worship and Power, primary state formation, where society with no knowledge of existing states forms a state on its own, is exceedingly rare in world history. Secondary state formation is far more common, where society develops a state influenced or aided by an already existing state, further influenced by factors ranging from religion, to culture, to military, to geography. Really and truly though, as Galus is sure to emphasize, there is no tidy theory of the origin of states. Theories of state formation are not easily generalized, nor can the broad patterns that have characterized the various actual histories of state formation fit neatly within any doctrine. But again and again, regardless of the specifics, we see that early elites, be they patriarchs, clan leaders, priests, wealthy readers, or rich farmers, created states to serve their interests, expand their wealth, and extend their power over others' labor. In Against the Grain, James C. Scott reached similar conclusions, with a focus on how the shift from hunter-gatherer societies to subsistence grain farming societies played a key role in state formation by serving as a basis for taxation, allowing states to exert control over the population. But don't get it twisted. While states needed settled populations to get their start, settled populations didn't need states. Scott takes the time to note that sedentism, farming, housing, irrigation, and even towns, all the things we associate with civilization, could be found in the historical record for nearly two millennia prior to the emergence of states. Still, they made it possible, but not certain, that a state could arise. Quote, This complex represented a unique new concentration of manpower, arable land, and nutrition that, if captured, parasitized might not be too strong a word, could be made into a powerful node of political power and privilege. Scott defines stateness on a spectrum, but eventually settles on the criteria that would identify the first states forming where we can see evidence of territoriality and a specialized state apparatus, particularly walls, tax collection, and officials. Essentially, where we see the development of the mechanisms needed to control the resources and labor of the population. And yet, despite its ill-intentioned origins, the state's existence has been justified, naturalized, and legitimized through various means, including simple tradition, as in it existed in the past, so it should continue to exist now, the divine right of kings, aka God said it's my turn to run things, the social contract, as if we collectively got together and agreed to submit to rule or have any real ability to withdraw consent within its framework, when we clearly don't, charismatic leadership, or the idea that we submit to be led by those we view as exceptionally heroic or virtuous, and finally, rational legal authority, where legitimacy comes from the belief that those in power got there in a legal manner and can justify their position through the law. Never mind the fact that, for all intents and purposes, they are the law. If it sounds like circular reasoning, it is, but it's also the reason Max Weber believed modern states rely on most to legitimize themselves. But should they be seen as legitimate? Should we accept the hegemony of states over all other forms of political organization? Are they truly the most effective means of managing our world? I don't think so, and nor do any other anarchists. Anarchism is a political philosophy and practice that opposes all hierarchical power structures along with their justifying dogmas, and proposes the unending pursuit of free association, self-determination, and mutual aid as the basis of our society. Our critique of the state is an extension of our critique of hierarchical power structures, or hierarchies, and the impact they have on those within them. Let me explain. Everybody has power, in the sense that everybody has the capacity to do and or to be, but that power differs from person to person. The measure of your power, the extent to which you can shape the world around you through your actions, is limited by your knowledge, your experiences, your resources, and most crucially, your position within various power structures, which shapes the interaction of individuals' powers. 
hierarchical power structures give some groups or individuals within them both greater power than and power over other groups or individuals within them. Those at the top have authority, not in the sense of knowledge or expertise, but in the sense of the recognized right above others to give commands, make decisions, and enforce obedience to their will. It should be noted that the use of force or even violence alone does not entail hierarchy. Using force to pull a child out of incoming traffic does not create a hierarchy. Oppressed groups using violence to fight back against their oppressors does not automatically make them their oppressors' oppressors. On the other hand, kings, generals, police captains, presidents, capitalists, and other authorities often don't personally use violence at all. But thanks to their recognized position within hierarchically organized social institutions, they have the power to command others, even to do violence on their behalf. The problem with hierarchy is quite straightforward. It divides society between rulers and ruled, order givers and order takers, authorities and subjects. It necessarily institutionalizes and stratifies power disparities when in reality, mere differences in ability are simply another dimension of our human diversity and mutual interdependence. You could fix cars or heal illnesses, I could write books and grow food. But we remain equals because our differences do not inevitably and automatically create social stratification. Hierarchy, instead, is a specific form of social arrangement that reinforces itself through sheer inertia, material leverage, social conditioning, occasional violence, near total predominance as a form of social organization, and structural barriers to continuously build up the power of some and limit the power of others. This relationship between those vested with power over others and those placed under submission to that authority shapes them both. Anarchists are especially concerned with how hierarchies limit the powers that those below them have and develop. Our alienation from the practice of control of our lives and spaces causes us to lack practice in controlling our lives and spaces, which reinforces our dependence on the hierarchies that deprive us of that ability. Our powers, drives, and consciousness all reinforce each other. So when we're subject to hierarchical power structures, our perceived potential ends up limiting our actual potential. Think of, for example, how patriarchy has historically acted to limit the drives of women and men alike to traditional gender roles and their associated aspirations so that a status quo could be maintained. Think of how subordinate groups internalize their oppression, convinced of the inevitability of hierarchy and imbued with a false consciousness that obscures the source of our exploitation. Even authorities are deprived by hierarchy. They may enjoy greater power, but they are also isolated from the experiences and perspectives of those below them. Hierarchy necessarily creates conflict between us. Rulers and ruled clash over their opposing interests. Authorities fight amongst themselves to accrue greater power, and the oppressed fight among each other over limited resources and opportunities. That's not to say that conflict wouldn't exist without hierarchy but that hierarchy enables the vast majority of the conflict in our world today. The state, with its division between government and governed, is among the worst offenders of our humanity. From its origins to its modern manifestations, the state has never been anything other than a tool to concentrate the power to dominate. Through the executive, legislative, and judiciary branches of government, the civil service bureaucracy, the prisons, the military, the police, and the education system, the state extends its domination over the masses. Just as capitalism alienates us from control of our labor, the state alienates us from control of our society. Without the separation of superiors and inferiors, we would all be able to develop the powers, drives, and consciousness necessary to recognize our mutual interdependence and cooperate to get things done as equals. By anarchist standards, states fail the societies they rule because the state's minimal activities are necessarily biased toward narrow ruling interests rather than the divergent interests of the masses. Warmaking serves the ambitions of our rulers against their designated rivals and perpetuates violence on people and planet alike. State-making inherently concentrates rather than distributes power, even at its most democratic because the state's power is threatened by real diversity and it can leave no room for alternative forms of association that don't ultimately answer to itself. 
We should all know by now that when the state protects its internal or external allies, those are certainly not allies of ours. Extraction activities, like taxation and conscription, are just ways for the state to parasitically squeeze our resources and even our very bodies to enable its oppressive machinery. Finally, the state's involvement in adjudication, distribution, and production often biases the interests of the already privileged and powerful. What's more, the very structure of the modern state and its underlying high modernist ideology is doomed to fail us because it attempts to impose a simplified, legible order on our complex, diverse, and organic social reality. This isn't to say that certain forms of knowledge about the world do require a narrowing of vision to study and make sense of, but that simplification in service of the state operates for its benefit first and foremost, with all the consequences that, that entails. That's the message I gleaned from James E. Scott's Seeing Like a State, though I've taken it a bit further than Scott himself would, as he isn't really an anarchist. As Scott observed, while the pre-modern state knew very little about its subjects, their wealth, their location, or their very identity, the modern state has managed to take exceptionally complex, illegible, and local social practices, such as land and name and customs, and create a standard grid that it could use to centrally record and monitor its territory and population. Perhaps the clearest example of the consequences of state simplification can be found in the late 18th century rise of scientific forestry in Prussia and Saxony, which would form the model for forest management worldwide. In the eyes of their respective monarchies, the forest served only as a revenue in the form of timber. The actual tree, with its vast number of possible uses, was replaced by an abstract tree, representing a volume of lumber or firewood. Now, abstraction is an inherent aspect of analysis, but the state's especially narrow focus on its financial gain omitted the various flora and fauna, the forest's cultural significance for magic, worship, and refuge, and the surrounding society's other interactions with the forest through hunting, gathering, pasturage, fishing, charcoal making, and trapping. This omission is what laid the groundwork for what came next. Scientific forestry aimed to replace traditional forestry methods that were deemed unsatisfactory for fiscal planning. It began with precise measurements and calculations of timber and revenue yield, but soon ventured into creating more manageable forests by transforming diverse, old-growth forests into uniform, administratively convenient ones. The unintended side effects of this simplification included reduced biodiversity, thinner and less nutritious soils, and increased vulnerability to storms and pests. In response, the Germans pioneered the concept of forest hygiene to try to restore ecological balance. These efforts merely worked around an impoverished habitat that still focused on single-species timber production. Monoculture may be easy to measure, manage, and understand from the top down, but it is also less resilient to ecological crises compared to polyculture and thus requires continuous and harmful intervention in the form of fertilizers and pesticides to sustain its existence. The metaphorical value of this history should be clear. There are unforeseen dangers and deleterious consequences in the state's efforts to make the world more legible and manipulable from above and from the center. This effort to render the world legible in the eyes of the state extends even further than the simplification of forests. The natural world, even when shaped by human activities, is still too complex for straightforward administrative manipulation. Now imagine the effect of government intervention in human societies. State agents, like scientific foresters, are not interested in accounting for or representing the entirety of social reality. Instead, the abstractions and simplifications are guided by a limited set of objectives, historically centered around taxation, political control, and conscription. Take, for example, the invention of permanent, inherited surnames. The standardization of your name came about so that officials could identify their population for taxes, tithes, property, and conscription. English peasants in 1381 rebelled in part because of it. But statecraft carries on regardless. The informal and local economy becomes formal and multinational. Unplanned villages become planned grid cities. The commons are enclosed into neatly surveyed lots of private property and one's default anonymity becomes a national system of identification. Just as the scientific forester doesn't quite capture the real forest in its full diversity, 
The state only sees the human activity of its interest through the limited approximations of documents and statistics. Modern statecraft is, in many ways, a project of internal colonization, seeking to shape and dominate a population and landscape according to its limited lens. As Scott writes, The more static, standardized, and uniform a population or social space is, the more legible it is, and the more amenable it is to the techniques of state officials. Many state activities aim at transforming the population, space, and nature under their jurisdiction into closed systems that offer no surprises and that can be best observed and controlled. State officials can often make their categories stick and impose their simplifications because the state, of all institutions, is best equipped to insist on treating people according to its schemata. Thus, categories that may have begun as the artificial inventions of cadastral surveyors, census takers, judges, or police officers can end by becoming categories that organize people's daily experience precisely because they are embedded in state-created institutions that structure that experience. The state's most tragic episodes of social engineering have occurred on the foundation of this centrally administrative ordering of nature and society, further enabled by what Scott termed a high modernist ideology. High modernism is characterized by intense confidence in progress based entirely on the expertise of bureaucrats and intellectuals, mastery over nature and people, attempts to simplify complex environments and social dynamics, and disregard for historical, geographical, and social context. This was arguably the dominant ideology during the Cold War. Emboldened by especially authoritarian forms of the state that were willing and able to use the full weight of their coercive power upon an incapacitated civil society, to bring their high modernist designs into being. In Scott's conclusion, he says that what is perhaps most striking about high modernist schemes, despite their quite genuine egalitarian and often socialist impulses, is how little confidence they repose in the skills, intelligence, and experience of ordinary people. Scott dedicated significant time in the book to documenting the failures of forced villagization in 1970s Tanzania, Soviet collectivization, and the building of the capital city, Brasilia. But we won't be discussing those today. For now, we can say that in each of those cases, rigid, monocultural, and centralized designs clashed with the complexity and dynamism of real-life systems, leading to environmental degradation, social dislocation, and a loss of human agency. The state's failure of our complex and diverse human society in its attempts to impose a centrally legible social order is why I also believe the state cannot handle climate change, and especially more broadly, the ecological crisis. States currently fail the natural world because the state's relationship with nature is extractive, not reciprocal, and inherently divorced from the granular complexity of local ecologies. We literally saw this in the rise of scientific forestry. As Galilus argues in The Solutions Are Already Here, the original cause of our global ecological crisis is the state-driven project of colonialism, which served as the engine of industrial capitalism's expansion. Up to now, the underlying logic of that hubristic regime has enjoyed hegemony worldwide. But even if modern states were committed to the task of mitigating the climate crisis, and they certainly aren't in any meaningful way right now, their bureaucracy is often slow, their economic interests are obstructive, and the decision-making apparatus, whether autocratic or democratic, are ill-equipped to nimbly navigate our niche and rapidly evolving environmental challenges. In an article published by the Yale School of the Environment, English author Fred Pierce documented the reality that several high-profile initiatives to plant millions of trees promoted by governments around the world failed to accomplish even their simplest goals and grow any forests at all. In a rush to set world records and meet ambitious environmental targets, Government-led tree planting projects globally have been failing. In the Philippines, where a world record of over a million mangrove seedlings were planted, fewer than 2% survived a decade later due to poor site selection and ecological conditions. In Turkey, President Erdogan and others planted 11 million trees across 2,000 sites, yet as many as 90% of saplings had perished a mere two months later. In Mexico, the World Resources Institute found that rates of forest loss were currently greater in the states that were implementing the billion-dollar government-funded environmental recovery program than the states that weren't. These government-led phantom forests, 
projects that claim success without ensuring long-term survival and benefits, waste resources and labor, lead to false carbon offset claims, and undermine the credibility of tree planting as a mitigation strategy. To paraphrase Peter Gellaloos in The Solutions Already Here, are we actually buying more time for endangered species, threatened habitats, and vulnerable human populations? Or are we just buying more time for governments and companies to continue enriching themselves and operating the convenience of their profit margins and geopolitical strategies? Meanwhile, from Brazil to Kenya, some of the greatest efforts in reforestation and food sovereignty have been decentralized, grassroots, and autonomous. The best thing states can do in such cases is get out of the way. 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is protected by indigenous communities, who often lead these initiatives. Apparently, it bears repeating every time I bring them up that indigenous peoples are not inherently connected to the land, which I covered in my video Define Indigeneity. But scientists have proven that stateless indigenous socio-ecological management provides the same level of ecosystem support and protection as any imposed protected area. In an article published by Open Democracy, American climate activist Margot Lurie found that the conservation ideal of the so-called untouched wilderness mischaracterizes the carefully established relationships between communities and the lands they occupied. Historically, conservation began as an American state project of evicting indigenous communities from the biodiverse lands they cultivated. The state's project of conservation via dispossession pushes people off the land and into the lowest rungs of poverty to expand the state's supremacy over its territory. And in recent times, there's been a global intergovernmental push to reach a 30% conservation target by 2030, which threatens further displacements in the name of the environment. Still, Swedish author Andreas Malm proposes the idea of climate Leninism as a solution to the climate crisis, where we embrace a rapid, state-driven transformation of production and the organization of the economy in a situation of chronic emergency. Malm admits that he can't see how, quote, Anything other than state power could accomplish the transition required, given that it will be necessary to exert coercive authority against those who want to maintain the status quo. This idea that we need some sort of all-powerful state to take the reins and force needed change on behalf of the people is one I've encountered on multiple occasions. It ignores two realities. The first is that the state is a key pillar of the status quo, and the joint efforts of governments and corporations are the cause of our ecological crisis. The state's inherent deprivation of the people's powers, drives, and consciousness is an obstacle to the sweeping changes in social, ecological organization we actually need to mitigate the climate crisis and undertake true social, ecological revolution. I would argue that the grassroots initiatives documented by Peter Galilus and others have done more to contribute to transition than any state. The second reality is that even so-called revolutionary states in the Leninist legacy suppress not just those who wish to maintain the feudal or capitalist status quo, but also the workers and peasantry who sought a model of socialist society that did not submit to Leninist ambitions. Yet Malm argues in his book Corona, Climate, Chronic Emergency that we should adopt a climate response similar to war communism, which was a set of policies deemed necessary by the Bolshevik leadership to win the Russian Civil War. Those policies included the forced requisition of grain from the peasantry, which contributed to the Russian famine of 1921-22, one-man management in urban workplaces, shutting down any experiment in direct worker control, and an unchecked campaign of terror by the secret police against military deserters and political dissidents, including socialists. Malm claims that we shouldn't replicate all the horrors of war communism, but that we should take inspiration from that level of state mobilization. The specifics of Mom's vision involve seizing the state to defeat the big bad fossil capital through major rollouts of renewable energy and carbon capture technologies, as well as climate-friendly legislation, including mandatory global veganism. He doesn't bother to engage with degrowth or social ecology in the book at all, not even in passing, and his brief and denigrating engagement with anarchism is laughably ignorant. All in all, Mom's urgent proposal seems to place a lot of stock in the alleged efficiency of Lenin's top-down central planning while trying to wash his hands clean of its excesses. In doing so, he ignores both the specific dysfunctions of that historic model, including its consequent environmental pollution, and the inherent structural issues we found in Seeing Like a State. Past and present states, revolutionary or otherwise, simply do not have a good track record, either with the environment or with the people. The state is not a potential vehicle for emancipation. Only we can free ourselves. In fact, to borrow the phrase from a colleague of mine, we need to recognize 
that the state is counter-revolutionary. I'll let the OG anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon have the last word. To be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law-driven, numbered, regulated, enrolled, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, checked, estimated, valued, censured, commanded by creatures who have neither the right, nor the wisdom, nor the virtue to do so. To be governed is to be at every operation, at every transaction, noted, registered, counted, taxed, stamped, measured, numbered, assessed, licensed, authorized, admonished, prevented, forbidden, reformed, corrected, punished. It is under pretext of public utility and in the name of the general interest to be placed under contribution, drilled, fleeced, exploited, monopolized, extorted from, squeezed, hoaxed, robbed, then at the slightest resistance, the first word of complaint, to be repressed, fined, vilified, harassed, hunted down, abused, clubbed, disarmed, bound, choked, imprisoned, judged, condemned, shot, deported, sacrificed, sold, betrayed, and to crown all, mocked, ridiculed, derided, outraged, dishonored. That is government. That is its justice. That is its morality. So, in recognizing that the centrally planned social order of the state is, by nature, out of step with and unrepresentative of the essential aspects of real social and ecological functioning, thus failing both society and nature, what do anarchists propose as the alternative? In a phrase, anarchic social revolution, an ongoing and unending project of collective self-realization. No less than a complete transformation of our society, economy, culture, philosophy, technology, relationships, and politics. Letting go of hierarchical conditioning and realizing the freedom and power of all the people. The pursuit of anarchy is more than the absence of authority, more than a vacuum of power. It is the pervasive presence of consciously anti-authoritarian social relations and institutions. This is not the capital R revolution you may be used to thinking of. It is not some flashy, distant event in the future in which we storm the Bastille and get our comeuppance from the capitalists. It is not overnight. It is not starting from scratch. It is not about preparing to launch a civil war or coup d'etat. It's a continuous process by which we develop our own and others' consciousness, build networks and organizations that will expand our powers, and shape our drives to seek out and defend our freedom. It involves building robust and viable alternatives to the predominance of capitalism in the state that can weather their assaults and oppose them in turn. One of the main questions asked of anarchists is that of how we defend our revolutionary gains. Now, there are a few ways we can answer that question. Starting with the aforementioned clarification of how anarchists conceive of the process of revolution in the first place. That alone should make it clear that the answer for defense is not hierarchy. That would be like trying to put out fire with more fire or fight capitalism with more capitalism. Here and now, anarchists should be developing both counter-institutions worth defending and the strategies necessary to defend them. What those specific strategies are, I really can't say. I think it's important that we trust that people in the practice of winning their freedom will, of their own volition, fight to defend that freedom. My video on social revolution offers some suggestions for tactics that can compose a particular strategy, but there really are no grand blueprints or one-size-fits-all prescriptions for dismantling different hierarchies and expanding anarchic social relations. Nor should we bind ourselves to mimicking what has been done before. Our strategies will vary depending on what specific opportunities for confrontation and subversion present themselves. Those opportunities are best identified by developing a continuous analysis of current conditions so that we know when and how to act accordingly. And if anarchist projects have made enough progress that they represent a viable and independent alternative to hierarchical organizations, then I would argue that our gains would defend themselves. You see, participation in society is necessary as a consequence of our mutual interdependence. And in a society where a particular form of organization is predominant, individuals tend to adopt the values associated with that form of organization. When hierarchical forms of organization are predominant, hierarchical values are similarly predominant. As I said before, this is one of the main ways that hierarchies maintain themselves. So, if anarchic forms of organization were predominant, then anarchic values must be predominant, making it quite difficult to attempt to impose hierarchy from scratch because anarchism is not just the absence of hierarchy, 
but conscious opposition to it. The foundational principles of anarchist alternatives to the state and capitalism can be found in free association and federation. I'll be spending some more time discussing both in an upcoming video on organized anarchy. Stay tuned. In short, free association is a principle of social organization. It is the way we organize without hierarchy, freely coming together and apart at various points of consensus and divergence as a natural consequence of our species' mutual interdependency. We need each other to survive and pursue our interests, no matter what form of society we find ourselves in. As Kropotkin said, mutual aid is a factor of our evolution. Organizing based on free association means cooperating and problem solving on the basis of our interdependency without relying on hierarchical power structures. Federation is a principle of anarchic organization that is entirely distinct from the form of federation seen in some governments. The federative principle involves the decentralization of society and the dynamic process of organizing its parts into groups that may overlap merge, split, and dissolve according to the identified interests in a mutual, horizontal manner. For example, as described by anarchist Sean P. Wilbur, federation might take the form of consultative bodies that focus on gathering and disseminating knowledge for informed action. This reminds me of a concept that James E. Scott explores, which is how seeing like a state blinds you to the role of Métis, a form of knowledge that would serve a critical role in anarchic organization. Métis is defined as a wide array of practical skills and acquired intelligence in responding to a constantly changing natural and human environment. Only through direct involvement and experience can we acquire Métis. And that sort of contextual, particular, and practical wisdom is crucial for developing flexible and diverse social institutions. On the other hand, there's techni, or technical knowledge, which is expressed precisely in hard and fast rules, principles, and propositions that are applicable universally. Techni differs from Métis quite radically in terms of how it is organized, codified, modified, and taught. 10 times 10 is always 100. Both Métis and Techni are valuable forms of knowledge, but Scott observed the recurrent theme in Western philosophy and science of attempting to reformulate knowledge systems to eliminate all uncertainty. Yet the practical knowledge of Métis found in some traditional medicines and agricultural techniques has often preceded scientific understanding. That isn't to fetishize Métis or devalue techni, but to recognize that the often disregarded former is no less valuable than the latter. The anarchist alternative of consultative bodies should involve both techni and Métis knowledge to properly inform the actions of those who choose to associate with them. In The Solutions Are Already Here, Peter Gellus encourages us to move from technocratic timetables and approaches to the ecological crisis towards, quote, the networking of thousands of empowered territories, each one approaching the horizon of a complex, imagined future that prioritizes the health and happiness of that territory and its inhabitants. We need to find the seeds of those empowered territories all around us, nurture them, cultivate them, and link them in a rhizomatic web that will become stronger than any institution of the ecocidal system that has already fallen to ruin. Strong enough so that as many of our living communities as possible, human and non-human, all enmeshed, will survive the upheavals and disturbances as our planet tries to heal from centuries of abuse. I can't help but wholeheartedly agree. It's a fairly common assumption that any conscious change at an enormous scale must be done through the state. But when it comes to mitigating the ecological crisis and pursuing social revolution, change must spring from below. Whether we're building robust social networks that can produce and distribute to meet people's needs, developing people's consciousness of their own power as individuals and collectives, slashing global corporations at their roots, rebuilding soil in partnership with flora, fauna, and fungi, or bringing together traditional and experimental ecological knowledge at the niche local level, Change must be led by the people themselves, not a slightly different regime. The state will not protect us. In fact, though some of us may die, that's the sacrifice it's more than willing to make. There will never be decolonization by decree. The complex and reciprocal relationships of the healthy forests, metaphorically and literally, cannot be imposed by the stamp of authority. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow people. Thanks to the seedlings, the saplings, and especially the roots for making all this possible. Including our newest members, Oatmeal, Idra, Zio's Daddy, 
and vaguely leftist. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash saying true. Check out my other videos for a range of radical topics. Thanks again. Peace.